Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet more Warhammer 40k lore, where today we are going to have a look at Asdrubal Vect, King Cunt of Komorog, Il Duce of Dirtbags, and Boss Bastard of the Dark Eldar. I did say I was going to make a video on this particular conniving little monster at some point, and the time has finally come. Let us start, as we usually do, all the way at the beginning, though, bear in mind, this particular origin story has some... potential inconsistencies with uh, <laughs> reality, shall we say. Because we've actually heard from Azdrubal Vect's very own lips how precisely his story began. But let's face it... The Archon of the Black Heart has, at best, a liberal relationship with the truth. Nevertheless, to hear him tell it, he started his existence as nothing more than a servant, the lowest amongst the low, a slave, in fact, a sacrifice. He was to be killed in honour of some unnamed deity, or perhaps Deity is not the correct word. This was way back, just before the fall of the ancient Eldar Empire, when the cults of pleasure were not only on the rise, but pretty much in their preeminent position within society. They were vast and monstrously powerful organisations, and those who did not agree with them had either already fled due to fear and terror of what was to come, waking visions of a hungry demonic deity and such things, or been um, suitably dealt with. They did not necessarily worship a god, these cults of pleasure, but perhaps it would be more accurate to say that they worshipped sensation in and of itself, which, of course, is uh, precisely why they gave birth to Slanesh. But, anywho, Vect was a sacrifice. He was to be offered up on the altar of pleasure on the very self-same day that she who thirst burst into reality saving Vect's life. Just before, the priest, presumably, was about to slash his little throat and save the galaxy a whole lot of trouble in the future, Slanesh was born, spanking her way happily into our material universe and tearing the heart out of the Eldar Empire whilst doing so. Because remember, children, no matter how much the pointy-eared little shits may tell us that, oh, monkeg, a vile, barbarous species that pollutes the galaxy and brings nothing but dreadfulness to our kind and gentle stars, they gave birth to a literal chaos god. An act of fuckery that humanity has yet to match. But... We shan't get too hung up in the clear and self-evident superiority of humanity over all knife-eared forms of garbage life. Instead, with the arrival of Slanesh, the Eldar Empire just was done. Flat out, with her appearance and the creation of the Eye of Terror, all of the central worlds in the Eldar Empire were snuffed out, pulled into the warp and de facto annihilated. All of the populace on these planets went with them. This is where one of the inconsistencies of Vex's little story comes in. He claims to have been on a world, presumably at the very edges of Slanesha's influence, where people were driven mad by the arrival of She Who Thirsts, but there is no mention of demons, but there is a mention of some being killed in the psychic backlash. So, presumably, whichever planet this was, it was on the absolute outermost edges of the uh, birth wound in the galaxy. Vect, being a smart little lad, realized that something was really, really, really wrong about all of this. Not only was he not getting stabbed, but the person who was planning to stab him had either been outright slain by the psychic backlash, or was currently in the process of disemboweling the rest of his cultists, having been driven instantly and irreversibly insane. And, of course, like all 
good forms of insanity, this was most assuredly the stabby kind. And the priest was not alone. The portions of the population that hadn't been outright killed had either probably gone insane or were currently whimpering in terror somewhere, wondering why their leisurely lives had been brought to such a sudden and dramatic halt. Vact, figuring that this was no time for self-pity, grabbed the nearest weapon and set about organising a militia force to defend himself and the temple. He then went around to the other cult temples as well, reorganising them. Anyone who would listen, he brought into the fold, and anyone who wouldn't listen, he shot between the eyes. Which, in retrospect, is an excellent example of how the Eldar conduct most of their diplomatic efforts, it seems. I still remember that one time they wanted to ask the Emperor for help, and they did so by invading the inner sanctum of the Imperial Palace, slaughtering any and all Imperial servants they found, and engaging in open battle with the Legio Custodes. <sighs> Eldar diplomacy. But in the case of Vect's efforts, they proved to be pretty damn effective. He secured himself enough supplies and enough weapons, armor, and followers to ensure that he could both find suitable bolt holds to ride out the storm, and also ensure that he could acquire further supplies, if necessary, from those with less in the way of weapons, armor, and followers. It became clear, however, that this was uh, not a storm that you could hide from. The birth of Slanesh meant that she would now be... she? He? It? The thing would continuously be sipping away at the souls of the Eldar species, and anyone that was not in the very furthest reaches of Eldar space when the calamity occurred would eventually inevitably be devoured by Slanesh, a worse fate than any imaginable, even with the considerable powers of imagination possessed by the Eldar. And thusly, obviously, escaping from this psychic threat was of paramount importance, and Vect was amongst the first who realized that if there was nowhere to hide in the material universe, and certainly nowhere to hide within the warp, then the only option was to hide in a place between the material universe and the immaterial universe. And luckily for the Elder, they had just the thing in mind. The Webway. These vast interstellar highways, literal tunnels bored through time and space, existed outside of the material universe, but not quite within the warp. It meant that the Eldar could stay within its confines and protect themselves, at least to a relative degree, from the attentions of she who thirsts. There were, of course, some problems, logistical issues, difficult to grow stuff within the webway, at least to begin with, but slowly yet surely, small communities began popping up, and one of the first of these communities, founded by Vect, was what was at the time a minor port of sort that went by the name of Komorog. But Vect wasn't going to have the webway all to himself for very long at all. The rest of the Eldar who had survived the awakening of Slanesh also fled in there, realizing that it uh, was a pretty damn good idea to be honest, and soon the webway was downright overpopulated. Now, the webway is a bit of a strange thing in that it doesn't necessarily obey the laws of physics, although it can provide a rough simulacrum if wished for. This means that today the dark city of Komorog is a vast, unimaginably vast cityscape. Just think of this for a second. The entire Eldar Empire. A race so vast and so mighty it once ruled the entire galaxy. Now, of course, a fair bit of them fled out to the outer reaches in craft worlds or isolated themselves, yet further were slain outright or driven insane by the appearance of Slanesh, but the rest of them, almost all, moved into the webway.
billions upon billions upon billions upon billions, all living in the exact same area on the exact same piece of real estate. Yeah, it got crowded fast. And with all of these refugees from the material world, they brought with them a lot of the traditions of the bygone empire as well. The noble classes, for example, still in possession of considerable power of influence, simply moved on into the webway and set about re-establishing their society just the way it had once been. Yeah, well, poorer, yes. But surely, in such dark times of destitute desperation, only the nobility could be trusted to lead, surely. And certainly no upstart slave that was to be sacrificed. And Vect couldn't really do much about this. He'd garnered himself a bit of a power base, to be sure, but nothing that could, in any way, shape, or form, compare to the old noble houses. And so, as they moved in, Vect moved back, disappearing into the shadows and forming his own little organizations and engaging in his own little experimentation. Vect himself claims that he was the one that came up with the idea that maybe, just maybe, the Dark Eldar could replenish themselves via devouring the souls of others. To, um, Put this in a somewhat abstract way, a nice example I, I think I've read in a Dark Eldar Codex somewhere, though don't quote me on that one. If one imagines the soul of an Eldar to be a, a vessel, a cup, for example, Slanesh is always just stealing away a little bit of essence from that cup all the time, a little bit of fine wine, if you say. And the cup, therefore, gets a little bit more empty and a little bit more empty and a little bit more empty all the time until eventually reducing the Eldar into nothing more than a withered, drained husk. It is an extraordinarily slow and torturous death that can take decades, centuries, potentially. The progress is different from individual to individual. For some, it is far more rapid than others, but... Eventually, it will always lead to death by literal draining of one's soul. And considering who's drinking, <laughs> it is a rather unpleasant experience, one which the Elder wanted to avoid at all costs. This is once again where Vect's claim comes into play. He claims to have discovered that if one were to take one of the many other minor species of the galaxy, say, for example, a certain race of hairless monkeys on a little dirtball planet off in the Western Galactic Arms, uh, and you were to expose this creature to a rather unpleasant environment, then the pain, the suffering, and the extreme emotions of said creature could revitalize the Eldar. It could fill their cups at the expense of its own. Theoretically, this would function along the same lines as the warp in general. If a creature is encouraged to have extreme emotions, then it will provide warp energy, it will cause ripples in the warp. But if you do this in an area like the webway, where access to the warp is limited, and it is done around a highly psychically sensitive species such as the Eldar, then it is entirely possible that they could, in fact, siphon off this energy for their own benefits. And, indeed, that turned out to be precisely the case. As for Vect's claims that he was the one who invented this, eh, I don't know about that one. Vect is absolutely brilliant, no doubt about that, but there is another faction within Dark Eldar society, as they're called now, which claim responsibility for this innovation, namely the homunculi. And judging by their particular fondness for this field of research, I would probably say it'd be more reasonable to attribute this particular discovery to their efforts instead. Not that I would ever say that to Vect, of course. <laughs>
Though if I were to be forced to speculate, I would perhaps also mention that if Vect truly was the one who came up with this particular innovation, an innovation that would be absolutely 100% necessary to the continued survival of every last refugee of the old Eldar Empire, then someone as clever as Asdrubael Vect would surely have found some way to monopolize this knowledge and use it to further his own status in society. You know, just like the homunculi did. But hey, details, details. We shall not question little Vecti Boys' relationship with the truth too much on the off chance that we actually do live in the 41st millennium. So let us instead move on to the Noborus. They had quickly moved in to the webway and started to reshape society. But they had competition. One of the earliest addition to the webway, the area that would eventually become known as Komorog, was two suns. Literal stars, literal giant ginormous balls of energy, gas, and plasma, trapped within the webway, utilizing hyper-advanced Eldar technology to ensure they didn't, you know, scorch everything nearby, or bombard the entire webway with lethal radiation, but instead utilized all of their considerable energy-generating potential to fuel the Dark City and its new densians. This, obviously, was an innovation, uh, perhaps an adoption, more correctly, of already existing technology, almost equally important to the continued survival of the Eldar trapped within the webway, as that of the siphoning of lesser creatures' souls. And obviously, therefore, it garnered itself quite the following. The pleasure cults had already been a potent force within the old Eldar Empire, and now presented with another object, absolutely necessary for their continued survival, it wasn't particularly difficult to start up various solar cults as well. And this was not something the nobles were going to accept. They wanted to maintain their monopoly, their social standing, and the solar cults were in a position to threaten all of that. They'd been viewed as cute little aberrations to begin with, but as they started presenting social, cultural, and political motivations, they could no longer be allowed to exist. But by the time the nobles had begun to react, the solar cults had already established themselves to a considerable degree within new Eldar society, and a massive war erupted within the webway. A civil war between those loyal to the noble houses, those who followed the solar cults, and pretty much everyone else in the form of small entities, mercenary bands, or Minor organizations, power structures, too small and insignificant to be of note for the nobles or the solar cults. One of these small groups was a newly founded cabal that called themselves the Cabal of the Black Heart. They were also the very first to call themselves the Eladrith Yeneas, or Dark Eldar. Led, of course, as I am sure you've already realized, by a certain Asdrubael Vect. He offered his services to anyone willing to pay, and anyone he figured might be in with the chance of winning this conflict. And he doubtlessly worked quite a bit for both the Solar Cults and the various noble houses over the course of the Eldar Civil War before eventually the noble houses emerged victorious, and Vect, of course, on the winning side, though he had earned himself quite a few enemies. Some of the largest noble houses, Zelian, Kralish, and Yelithian, had all recognized Vect as a considerably more uppity individual than they were entirely fond of. But all efforts to assassinate Vect had ended with not only dismal failure, but often the accidental deaths of both the assassins and whoever had hired them. Most perplexing indeed, 
For surely the lowly leader of a mere cabal, a band of bandits and ruffians could not possibly possess the kind of subterfuge and low cunning required to turn the tables on the noble houses. No, surely not. It was just a question of time until they found something with which they could hang him with. But over the course of the next few millennia, they didn't find anything. Vect continued to be the leader of a minor cabal, and despite their best efforts, the nobles could not unseat him. Eventually, they probably grew complacent, figuring that, well, they were in power, their armies were vast, their henchmen were beyond counting, and surely Vect was no actual real threat to them. Although, he had been very active as of late. Vect and his Cabal of the Black Heart had been launching more and more raids into Imperial space. Raids very close to the entrance of the webway behind which Komarog lay hidden. Hmm. This was disconcerting. Surely the stunted sensory equipment of the humans would not be able to detect the brilliantly disguised entrance of the city of Komarog, but Nevertheless, blatantly antagonizing the Imperium like that, whilst they were but mere furless apes, of course, they had grown remarkably powerful, remarkably quickly, and the Eldar were not exactly at their best. But despite their misgivings, the Noble Houses simply couldn't find any good arguments to level against Vect. He was perhaps being a bit careless, but that was the worst. And in return, Vect and the Cabal of the Black Heart was responsible for slaves streaming into the Black City, unimaginable quantities of human cattle and wealth. And the Cabal was offering up all of the required taxes, in fact, more than the bare minimum. Some noble houses even started fearing that perhaps, perhaps, the Cabals were trying to organize some form of alliance to start a second Eldar civil war against them. They might need to move against the Cabals sooner rather than later. But no evidence indicating any such forming alliance could be found. And bear in mind, this was within what was at this point basically Dark Eldar society. If a massive coalition was forming, there should have been plenty of turncoats willing to reveal this information in return for suitable rewards, or alternatively suitable threats of consequence should they choose to not divulge whatever they knew. And so the noble houses found themselves confused, looking for threats from the inside, looking for rivals in other noble houses, or looking for any indication on behalf of the cabals that they were planning something untowards. And while staring ever so intently inwards, they failed to notice a sound, a quiet, nearly imperceptible sound of gears whirring and clanking and grinding against one another as first one, then another, and then another slowly but surely began moving and exerting influence on the next cog in the long line of wheels. The machinery of the Imperium was at work. But the nobles in their gilded palaces could not imagine that the Mon Keg could be any sort of threat to them whatsoever. Little did they realize that not even the Imperium, slow as its bureaucracy might be, would sit idly by and watch their worlds being raided in ever greater numbers with ever greater frequency by a strange race of piratical Eldar that all seemed to be emerging from one specific area of space. Now, of course, we mere humans may be dim creatures, mere morons when compared to the almighty Eldar, who murder-fucked a god into existence, an achievement that, granted, we have not been able to equal, but... When we see hundreds upon hundreds of raids all being launched within the very same sector of space, 
the Desiderian system to be precise, even our little noggins will eventually begin jogging. For you see, up until now, the noble houses had kept their predation upon the Imperium to a bare minimum. They had maintained that raids should be sporadic, and preferably as far away from the entrance to Komarog as Eldali possible. They did not wish to arouse any suspicion, and for the nobles that was no problem. They got the best picks of the slaves anyways. They were still able to live in opulent luxury. The fact that the rest of the population of Komarog lived at what was essentially starvation levels... Eh, who cares? This, by the way, was another reason why they found it so difficult to move openly against Vect. He was making himself a very popular man by lowering the price on slaves, allowing more Dark Eldar to take part in slaving operations and win glory and riches for themselves. And so even though the noble houses knew that this was dangerous, they were too slow to act, or simply unable to act, having been left completely checkmated by Vect's own manoeuvres. And make no mistake, Vect was not launching these raids out of greed, or because he was ballsy, or reckless, or underestimated the Imperium. Quite the opposite. He was doing this precisely because he knew how dangerous the Imperium could be. He had been prodding and probing it for decades, perhaps even centuries, learning how it might react to being poked sharply in the ribs. And then, once he knew exactly how it might react, he began poking. And soon thereafter, a strike cruiser of the Adeptus Astartes was dispatched to figure out precisely what the heck was going on. It was from the Salamanders chapter, one of the more humane chapters of the Adeptus Astartes, who actually give a shit about the suffering of the civilian populace. The strike cruiser was already out hunting for artifacts, but upon receiving the request from the Adeptus Administratum, it immediately diverted to investigate the cause of the rise in piratical activity in the sector. And soon thereafter, as if by pure happenstance and not orchestrated in any way, they happened upon a black heart Cavalite fleet, who just so happened to be equipped with considerable numbers of haywire bombs. They immediately assaulted the Salamander strike cruiser, and whilst of course it offered fierce resistance, severely damaging some of its attackers, the haywire bombs eventually disabled the Adeptus Astartes vessel. Maintaining life support and all necessary functions aboard, the Space Marines were essentially trapped aboard their vessel. The Blackheart fleet then transported the entire ship and its still fully awake and aware crew through the secret hole in the space leading into the Eldar webway and Komorog. My, my, what a, what a careless action. Surely Vect here has done a dumb, right? These are Salamander Space Marines. To divulge the secret location of Komorog so easily. Risque. Very risque. And even worse, in a moment of spontaneous carelessness, Vect relaxed the restrictions upon his fleet's communication. For just an instant, the iron hard discipline faltered, and news of Vect's rich bounty fluttered out into the streets of Komorog, where it swiftly spread like wildfire. This was no mere slaving mission, these were no mere Monkeg prisoners, these were Astartes. Now, a human is, to an Eldar, a light snack at best, you know. It's a drop in the bucket of their souls. It's not going to give them much in the way of satisfaction, entertainment, or fuel for their dark purposes. Their lives are simply too brief, their sensations too stunted. It requires a lot of work to wring the necessary quantity and quality of suffering out of a human. 
An Adeptus Astartes, on the other hand, oh, now that is a rare treat. So far elevated above that of baseline humanity, and so deliciously stubborn. A salamander could be tortured for months, years, decades, if carefully managed, and every last drop of his precious Vita would be like the finest wine, even to the highest echelons of Dark Eldar society. And, even better, this particular strike cruiser was under the command of a salamander's captain. Ooh. If a space marine was a rare delicacy, this was one of the finest treats the galaxy could offer. Not to mention, of course, the incredibly valuable information possessed by a captain of the Adeptus Astartes. Whoever was in control of this prize would find his fortune skyrocketing drastically. And so, of course, the various noble houses upon Komorog immediately acted to ensure that they would be the ones in possession of this, and not this foolish upstart Vect who had been so careless as to let news of his bounty slip. And despite Vect seemingly taking every precautionary measure thereafter, going to ground in the deeper, more secretive recesses of Komorog, his relatively small band of ships, along with the Salamander strike cruiser, the Forge Hammer, was surrounded by a massive armada under the command of the noble house Zillion, led by their Archon, Lord Zillion himself, who of course immediately requested, nay, <laughs> requested, <laughs> silly arch, <clears throat> demanded upon pain of death via butt torture, that Vect immediately hand over his prize, which Vect, of course, very reluctantly and with great protestation, eventually forced to face the superiority of his opponents, did. Thusly, Lord Zillion returned back home to his private abode, a series of behemoth towers in some reach of Komorog, large enough to house the entirety of the forge hammer within them, feeling oh so very, very pleased with himself. He had secured for himself a prize, the envy of practically every noble house on Komorog and he had the power with which to defend it, unlike that failure Vect. And all he had to do now was pry the delicious little morsels from within their adamantine sarcophagus, which surely would be easy enough. The forge hammer could be kept helpless and immovable within massive haywire fields within the towers of Lord Zillion's estate. And the hull, well, primitive monkeg design, it would be all too easy to cut through it. And that was precisely what Lord Zillion ordered to be done. The strike cruiser itself was not particularly valuable, again, primitive monkeg technology, nothing particularly interesting there. So, dozens upon dozens of strike teams of warriors, and even some of the Archon's own elite troopers, began cutting their way through the hull. Before long, entrance points had been created, and the first few warriors dropped into the dark interior of the forge hammer, the very first of them almost immediately coming face to face with what looked oddly like a tiny, tiny little flame. Odd that. Why would even a race so primitive as the Monkeg use candles to light their starships? Wait, candles moving. The candles growing larger. I can just see the form of a large armoured warrior in the glittering glow of the candlelight. The pilot light. A monstrously large flamer. <laughs> Whoosh. And so ended the first entrance into the Forge Hammer. Many more were to come, but most were to end in much the same way. It turns out that the Space Marines of the Salamanders chapter were not quite as cooperative as the usual cattle stock of the Imperium. 
And soon, the insides of the forge hammer rung loudly and insistently with the sound of hammering bolters, roaring chainsaws, the shatter crash of splinter rifles, and the subtle hiss sound of energy fields being activated on power swords and dark eldar glaives alike. Lord Zillion had first sent in a dozen strike teams, then a dozen more, and then a hundred more. And whilst the dark corridors of the Forge Hammer certainly flowed with the rich, oxygenated blood of the Adeptus Astartes, it was intermingled with a far greater quantity of darkish red Eldar blood. This was a lose lose scenario. Certainly, Lord Zillion could simply keep pouring warriors in, and eventually the Forge Hammer's defenders, stubborn as they were, would eventually crumple. There were only so many Astartes aboard, after all, and Lord Zillion's reserves were, in comparison, virtually untouched and practically inexhaustible. But how many warriors would he sacrifice for this? A thousand? Two thousand? Three thousand? And how many morsels would he actually be able to capture? Dead Space Marines benefited the Dark Lord Zellian very little. There were still secrets and delicacies to be prized from their dead flesh, certainly. The Astartes gene seed amongst them, but the value of a dead Astartes is considerably less than a live one. And if you're trying to take a Space Marine alive... <laughs> That's going to complicate a whole lot of things, I'm afraid. And with this in mind, uh, Lord Zillion decided it was um, time for a grand gesture. His seizure of the Forge Hammer had not gone unnoticed, and there were quite a bit of rumblings by those who were... Uh, jealous, <laughs> let's put it rather blatantly there, about the prize that the good Lord had apparently managed to acquire for himself. Some were even doing a little bit of saber rattling, but holding back just to see how things worked out. Lord Cillian then decided that okay, all right, maybe, just maybe, I was acting a hint abrasive towards dear little Vect. Downright cuntish, some may even say, although their lives will be short and miserable if they were to do such a thoughtless thing. I, the great, wonderful, and generous Lord Zillion will hand the forge hammer back to Vect. From just that kind of nice guy. And Vect, unable to smell anything else for several weeks thereafter due to all of the fish apparently slapped in his face, graciously accepted, of course, and then began doing exactly what Lord Zillion had done, trying to take the Astartes alive. But as Coinky Dinks would have it, Vect had been spending the last few days very productively indeed. After that whole little accidental security lapse when he'd brought the forge hammer into Komorog, Vect had identified a, a great quantity of less than entirely trustworthy individuals. Now a lesser warlord might um might take umbrage at this. He might purge his ranks of non-believers and traitors, but Vect was not such a petty individual. He was aware that the greatest virtue was, of course, to turn the other cheek. And so, instead of punishing these wayward sheep, he instead granted them a great honour, a chance to earn glory and riches by venturing into the forge hammer and capturing the Mastartes alive. Unfortunately, as fate would have it, very few of these individuals ever emerged again from the hull of the forge hammer, and those who did, mostly fleeing in panic, well, you know, cowardice. You can forgive a lot of things, but cowardice. No, 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 no. That has to be dealt with most severely by. Uh, Effectively placed blocking troops, of course, of course, you know, you gotta maintain some level of standards, otherwise Komorog won't stand till Christmas. And speaking of standards, whilst Vect was carrying out a strangely piecemeal and unorganized assault upon the Forge Hammer, the skies above Komorog suddenly tore open 
revealing what looked a damn lot like the entire Salamander's chapter had just warped in through the gateway. You know, the secret gateway, which was open. How, 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 how odd. What, what happened to the guards? Well, they were all derelict of their duty, found either dead or missing from their controls. My, what a coinkydink once again. That, you see, that's what happens when standards are allowed to slip. But how did the Salamanders even find this place? This is one of the most secretive areas in the entire goddamn galaxy. Protected by what, what, what was once, anyways. A fully operational Eldar Tech stealth shield. Well, it so happens that Vect had um, <clears throat> forgotten to inform the rest of Dark Eldar society that uh, the, the Imperium was quite fond of psychers. Uh, particularly psychers of the communicative kind, and the fact that there was a librarian aboard the Forge Hammer, well, you know, it's just one out of hundreds of warriors. You can see how such a fact might slip Vect's mind in the heat of the moment. He was being threatened by an entire armada of other Dark Eldar ships, after all, and he had had a lot on his mind afterwards, you know. <laughs> He is, he is but a mere human, or oh, Elder, excuse me, he's not perfect, okay? Oh, and, um, did I remember to mention also that when Lord Cillian so graciously offered the Forge Hammer back to Vect, he also offered to, uh, keep the Forge Hammer within his own personal abode, so, so as to ease the matter, you know, so, so as to give some support to Vector, not at all to steal the Forge Hammer and its crew away once they had been subdued, of course not, he, he, he would never do such a thing, and Vect would never suspect him of such a thing either, he very cooperatively showed up with his men in Lord Zillion's own spires. The uh, spires that were currently broadcasting a Salamander's SOS signal, just as the Salamander chapter fleet arrived. Well, that's downright unfortunate. <laughs> truly, truly downright unfortunate, and to make matters even worse, the Howling Griffins and the Silver Skulls of the Adeptus Astartes had also decided to join in on the fun, cause, you know, a brother in danger and all that. Two dozen strike cruisers and a battle barge were raining fire down upon the dark city of Komorog. These were vessels capable of flattening entire cities, or cracking open whole planets if given enough time, and they were now shotgunning absolutely everything. With the capital ship, the Battle Barge of Vulcan's Wrath, big even for a battle barge, ramming straight into Lord Zillion's main spire in an effort to rescue the Forge Hammer and its complement of Salamander Space Marines. <laughs> Crushing Lord Zillion in the process, by the by. As Zrubael Vect, however, well, he was on the other side of Komorog, organising further um, reinforcement parties to continue his ongoing efforts to secure the Forge Hammer. <laughs> Such a cooperative and friendly lad, that little Vect. And he'd better bring a lot of reinforcement too, as the strike cruisers and the battle barges massed gun batteries levelled vast stretches of Komorog. But the Dark City was not without its own defenders. Soon, knife-proud vessels were emerging from massive hangar bays to attack the Imperial ships, along with thousands upon thousands of fighters, strike craft and bombers firing out from hidden corridors and bolt holes all across the city, swarming the Imperial vessels, who responded by opening up with every weapon they possessed. Macro cannon batteries, lancers, bombardment turrets, point defense weapons, all were spewing death out as quickly as they could in every single solitary direction. Even then, they were beginning to be overwhelmed, the sheer quantity of Dark Eldar vessels proving too much for the targeting computers of the Imperial ships to even begin to calculate. 
But these were space marines. Guns weren't the only things they were bringing to the table. Drop pods and thunderhawks began shooting out from the massive strike cruisers and the battle barge currently lodged in Lord Zillion, <coughs> excuse me, ex Lord Zillion's primary spire. As they rained down upon the dark city, battle squads emerged and began hosing down everything they could see. Flamers torching entire towers, plasma guns blasting apart irreplaceable pieces of Eldar art and machinery, and cutting down everything that moved. No civilians in the Dark City, after all. But the Dark Eldar again responded swiftly, first with Lord Zillion's own forces who had been so rudely invaded. Warriors pouring out from damn near every nook and cranny, every house, every alcove, all armed with splinter weaponry of one form or another. Heavy cannons, rifles, and pistols. The Dark Eldar are quite fond of their Second Amendment rights, and for good reason. An unarmed Dark Eldar is not in for a long and prosperous life. Let's just leave it at that. And this, of course, also was a major stronghold within Komorog society. Lord Zillion had a massive host under his control, and a lot of combat specialists were swiftly deployed against invaders as well, including the homunculi and their vicious experiments of tortured mutant monstrosities. But the Space Marines, of course, as always, had come prepared for a fight, and their weaponry proved very effective against the Dark Eldar. Their elegant, yet thin and effective plate, which had provided plentiful protection against crude ballistic weaponry or LAS rifles, but proved woefully ineffective against Astartes' bolt rounds providing around about the same level of protection as a wet tissue paper condom might to a human before he engaged in violent coitus with a saber-toothed tiger. On the other hand, the Astartes' power armor provided plentiful protection against Dark Eldar splinter weaponry. And for those of you who are not aware, a Dark Eldar's primary weapon would be a splint weapon, be it a splint rifle, pistol, or cannon. These weapons function by firing out dozens, if not hundreds or thousands, of tiny little slivish shards of a crystalline substance filled with the most vicious venom. If this strikes a human, it will not kill him most of the time, it will simply disable him. The deep stabbing wounds from the crystalline splinters themselves would be bad enough, but as the neurotoxin starts taking effect too, the pain would leave virtually any human utterly and completely incapable of any movement that isn't simply writhing in pain on the ground. A weapon most befitting the Elder, and one very effective for slavery purposes as well, but, uh, crystalline shards against power armor. I imagine you can detect the source of the problem here for the Dark Eldar. Yet do not make the mistake of thinking that it was going all the Space Marines' way. They were disgustingly outnumbered. To begin with, only the upper quarters of Dark Elder society was under direct attack, but the arrival of a dozen or so strike cruisers didn't exactly go unnoticed for long, and soon the various other noble houses were also rallying on the attack, seeing an opportunity both to prove themselves and to perhaps steal away a few morsels of their own. They launched countless counterattacks against the Astartes forces, which held strong for the most part. The only Dark Eldar assault that looked like it could present a serious threat to the entire Astartes force was one led by one of the High Nobles, one of the High Archons of Dark Eldar society, one known as Kylark. He was leading a very successful masked counterattack at the head of his noble house, slicing into the Astartes, bringing them into close quarters combat, and tearing down each individual superhuman warrior with unsurmountable weight of numbers. While splint rifles might not be that effective against power armor, unload a few dozen of them at point-blank range, and something's gonna get through. Yet just as Kylark's counterattack looked set to perhaps possibly begin overrunning the Astartes, 
Woe of woes! A friendly fire incident occurred, as a dark lance vaporized the noble lord where he stood. No one could quite figure out where this stray weapons fire had come from, but all they knew was that their lord and master was dead, vanished without a trace, and in front of them was a lot of very angry space marines. But it wasn't long before the noble houses received a reinforcement. The various cabals joined their warriors in as well. Well, perhaps a reinforcement is not quite the correct term. Uh, competitors, perhaps? Other uh, quote unquote friendly forces who joined in the fighting? Friendly, with heavy quotation marks, mind you, and of course, the civilian populace of Komorog as well. Again, there is no such thing as an unarmed Dark Eldar, not in the Dark City, and with their thirst for action, for pain, torture, and with the potential prizes on offer, there were very few who let this opportunity pass them by. Soon, the Astartes were fighting not just a mansion's worth of defenders, not a noble house worth, not even several noble houses worth, they were fighting practically the entire population of Komorog, an entire subspecies of Eldar, essentially, all against six, seven hundred Astartes. Oh my, those are steep odds even for the God Emperor's angels, but all they needed to do was hold out for long enough for the rescue efforts directed towards the Forge Hammer to pay off. First Company veterans of the Terminator elites of the Salamanders chapter had teleported down utilizing beacons placed by advanced troops. They appeared on the hull of the Forge Hammer and directed their heavy weapons fire against scourges and helots flying around the Forge Hammer, trying to destroy it or at the very least disable or cripple it so that it could not escape. The noble houses realizing that if the Astartes were able to run away with their prize, a hell of a lot more than their pride would be dented. Their reputation within Komorog society would be shattered for all eternity, and with it would go their prestigious positions and names as well. The defenders of the Forge Hammer emerged from the battered hull of the vessel to join their firepower to the First Company veterans, targeting crack missiles and heavy weaponry against the vast pillars providing energy for the field keeping the Forge Hammer in place. As they fell one by one, the battered yet still intact hull and engineerium of the Forge Hammer began to lift the mighty vessel away from its prison. Emerging out into the sky above Komrog, its scarred, pitted, and clearly ravaged hull was clearly lit against the backdrop of constant battle and endless firing, with every gun in the invasion fleet still spitting death all around them, crisscrossing the skies with tracers both outgoing and of a more unfriendly variety. Followed shortly thereafter by Vulcan's wrath reversing its thrusters and hauling itself from the shattered spire of Lord Zillion, the Astartes Armada began its retreat. The captains and commanders aboard the vessels having realized that they had shoved their gene-enhanced dicks into quite the hornet hole, as it seemed, and indeed as was the case, they were fighting the entire bloody city. A remarkably well-armed and aggressive city at that. The chapters involved had already suffered considerable casualties, especially considering the engagement had lasted less than an hour already. Luckily, the portal, their exit, was still gaping wide open, and none of the force fields that could potentially have been capturing their vessels were being activated. Not questioning their good luck, the Astartes flotilla immediately made for the exit, blasting their way past the unorganized and ill-fortuned remnants of the noble fleets trying to bar their way. They escaped out into real space triumphantly, with the forge hammer in tow. <laughs> 
The entire war had lasted a couple hours at absolute most, from the arrival of the Space Marine vessels to the deployment of their strike forces to their eventual retreat and exit of the Dark City. And yet, tens of thousands, if not hundreds, if not millions of Dark Elder had been brutally slain, a lot of them with no chance of fighting back. A dozen strike cruisers all unleashing planet-breaking weaponry upon a vast cityscape at close quarters. Oh, that's gonna do some bloody damage. And when you add in a few hundred Astartes rampaging through the streets with heavy flamers and bolters as well. Oh yeah, it's gonna leave some scars, absolutely. But even more impactful upon Eldar society than the casualties because... <laughs> No Eldar Keldar is ever overly concerned about the fate of his neighbour, was the fact that this had not only shattered the vast armies of the noble houses since they had been the primary recipients of the Space Marines' not too gentle attentions, but it has also shown them as weak. And in Dark Eldar society, the last thing you are before you are dead is weak. Shortly thereafter, the Cabals would still retain most of their strengths, and yet had engaged in enough fighting to prove their worth, began picking away at the remaining noble houses. Like vultures circling so many corpses, it wasn't long until the Cabals were in complete control of the Dark City. And I'll give you three chances to guess which Cabal was found at the very top of the new social order. Vector done very well for himself in a very short period of time, and again, no one could blame him for this disaster. How could he have known? He'd been so cooperative every single step of the way. And any who still doubted his sincerity, well, there was basically a small civil war ongoing, and as we all know, in civil wars, people go missing all the time. No need to raise so much as an eyebrow at that. But of course, little Vecti boy was not done quite yet. He might now be one of the most powerful and most influential organizations within the Dark City, but that obviously wasn't enough, was it? Instead, he embarked upon his most ambitious plan yet. Now that he had a considerable power base, he engaged in politicking and machinations on a level that most humans would find difficult to even grasp, playing his enemies off against each other and making sure that everybody viewed Vect as practically harmless, despite all of the harm he was so very clearly wrecking upon everyone. Soon, the Cabal of the Dark Heart was not only one of the most influential and largest, but by far the most militaristic of all of the Cabals as well, and Vec decided that it was time to introduce a bit of order to Dark Eldar society. It had gotten so split and unorganized, it was falling apart with all of these minor internal conflicts. No standards again. And so he began seizing control of all of the various routes leading between the various segments of Komorog. At this point in time, Komorog was still made up of hundreds upon hundreds of small individual realms, little pieces of city floating more or less independent of one another that could be accessed through warp gates, essentially. Vect seized control of these warp gates and imposed strict rules and regulations on inter-cabal warfare, which eventually became traditions, martial law. He also, of course, made sure that anyone who didn't want to uh, obey his rules uh, were taken out one by one, as his loyal followers invaded each and every realm of Komorog, uniting them all into one single vast cityscape, what we now know as the Dark City of Komorog in all its glory. Every last single iota of resistance had been thoroughly crushed. Not a single soul in all of the Dark City now doubted who stood at the absolute top of the pyramid. 
as a Drubael Vect, the uncontested master of the Dark Eldar. It had taken him nearly 10,000 years, but he'd done it. He had risen from his humble beginnings as nothing more than a sacrificial slave to the most powerful individual in all of Dark Elder society. And since such a rank provides him with access to hundreds of thousands of fanatically loyal Cableite warriors and hundreds of warships, it also makes him one of the most powerful individuals in the entire galaxy. Not bad. Not bad at all. And the best part is, no one could even quite figure out how he'd managed to pull it all off. In the modern day Dark City, it's not so much that no one could ever dream of opposing Vect as no one would ever dream of even thinking the thoughts of opposing Vect, because surely he would be able to tell what they were thinking from the other side of the goddamn galaxy and set up a scheme so intricate that even Zinj would pop a boner over it. Which would certainly end in the very uncomfortable death of whatever disloyal individual had dreamt up those ludicrous thoughts of rebellion. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching this video on Asdrubael Vex. As always, if you enjoyed it, please do consider sharing it around and introducing others to this cuddly little creature as well. Have a good day.